Well, when I first received the script, um, at first I didn't fancy it. I thought it was a little too uh, uh, tricksy. And, uh, but having seen a lot of the uh, effects and the sort of movies now, like Lord of the Rings and uh, Matrix, uh, both of which were offered to me, I couldn't understand either of them when I read them. I think when he first met with the director in his kind of teasing way, he said, you know, they offered me The Matrix and I didn't understand it, so I turned it down. And they offered me The Lord of the Rings and I didn't understand it, so they turned it down. And I'm not sure I understand this, but I'm not going to turn it down. I really do love that clip because it just proves how much of a badass Sean Connery was. That he could literally get a job without understanding what it was. Like, who else could get away with that? Well, thanks again for coming in for the interview. Can you tell us what makes you think you're the best candidate for the role of branch manager? Beats me. Have you ever worked in a bank before? Uh, maybe, I think. It was the 70s. Uh, I was wearing some kind of red leotard thing. I, I think that was a bank. That's good enough! You're hired! Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again. My thanks to the very kind people who support me on Patreon, people like Alan Hilburn and Ben Cole. I am talking about the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Sean Connery's final live-action leading man role before giving up film almost entirely to spend the rest of his days in retirement. And it's weird to think that had it not been for this film, that might not have been the case. That notion makes you sweat. It's no secret that behind the scenes, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen was a complete mess. The most notable of conflicts being between star Sean Connery and director Stephen Norrington. And it's no coincidence that following their experiences on this film, neither man went on to work in such roles in big budget studio fare again. There are a lot of stories out there and some are disputed, so it's kind of hard to really know what was just gossip and what was genuine. But the main thrust of the matter, from what I can tell, is that Stephen Norrington was uncomfortable helming such a massive project as this, having to coordinate so many people on set, and then on top of that, the production suffering major setbacks, like in Prague, a load of the sets got flooded, and executives at 20th Century Fox were insisting that the film couldn't be pushed back from its release date. It had to release in the US in summer 2003, so there's a lot of stress there already. And then you have Sean Connery, who was obviously the big marquee star, as well as an executive producer on the film, and at this point, the man is 70 odd years old, he's a veteran of the industry, and he's having to come to work every day to see a director who is clearly not the right man for the gig at that time. In an interview about why he decided to retire from acting, Connery is quoted as saying of the director, On the first day, I realized he was insane. And in another interview, he's quoted as saying, I'm fed up with the idiot, the ever-widening gap between people who know how to make movies and the people who greenlight movies. So I think it's clear that we can surmise from these comments that whether Norrington himself let the pressures of the movie affect his judgments, or whether he maybe just wasn't pleasant to work with, I don't know, and I'm certainly not here to make that distinction or judgment, but whatever was causing him issues on set clearly led to headbutting with Connery, who, at his age, picking roles carefully and selectively, needed someone who he could really believe in to lead the project, someone who had a coherent creative vision for what the finished film would be. Particularly as Connery himself very openly admits that he didn't really understand the script or what they were going for, but he signed on in good faith, only to turn to the set to realise that everyone was on the same clueless page as him, and that must have been incredibly frustrating. And Connery at that point was known for giving notes on his films, and some of those might have led to some conflict, like this one, for instance, is recounted from the producer on the commentary track about Connery's insistence regarding whether or not he was going to be seen touching the Invisible Man. This is a funny scene because in the initial script readings, Connery turned to Norrington and said to everybody, so in this scene, I'm walking in the snow with Invisible Man with my arm around him. Yes. But if he's invisible, that means he's naked. Yes. So that means I have my arm around him and his tallywhack is just hanging out. Well, you can't see it. Yes, well, we're not going to be doing that. So, um, that was cut. But regardless of all that, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen did make its summer 2003 release in the US, and it was released in other parts of the world throughout the year, including in October in the United Kingdom, where it was my choice for my birthday cinema trip. So I had just turned 14 that week, and my dad was taking me to the cinema as like a birthday trip, and obviously the film that I picked was going to be the action movie starring Sean Connery, and we both went and saw it, and both kind of really liked it, and I believe I went back a couple 
couple of weeks later to see it on the big screen for a second time. I even have memories of the DVD coming out. Like, I was so excited for the release of this thing. Like, I think I might have actually even gone into the store to, like, pre-order it, like put down my deposit. I went into a shop and put down my deposit money and said, yes, please, I would like to have reserved a copy of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen on DVD, two disc special edition complete with slipcase. That was me. I was that guy. This behavior may have once qualified me as the world's biggest fan of this film, because at the time I remember the reception of it was quite tepid, but over time this thing has really gotten quite a name for itself as being something of a stinker. Cheers. I'm sure that the behind the scenes issues probably amplified this negativity too, and hey, I mean, the negativity is even there on the DVD, like the commentary tracks and the behind the scenes do not shy away from the occasional catty comment, which, not gonna lie, I appreciate it, and it's a damn sight more interesting and truthful than the usual kind of DVD extra interview. Just about every day walking on set was such a joy. I have been such a fan of director's other work that as soon as I got the call from him, I just knew I had to do the job. Producer was just so kind, and it really made you feel well welcoming every day walking onto that set. We were just like one big family, you know? One of the producers on one of them is all like, yeah, we wanted to get Monica Bellucci for this part, but she couldn't do it, so we had to scramble around last minute and got this lady instead, and it's like, wow, okay, flattering. And here's Peter Wilson. Peter ended up in the film due to um, some last minute scheduling conflicts with Monica Bellucci, and uh... I'll admit to being uh, somewhat like uh, less than thrilled with the choice when it was first made. <clears throat> Anyway, I hadn't gone back to this film in a long time, this is my first time seeing it in over 10 years, and it very much been built up in my brain as this total turkey of a film, probably from other reviews that I'd seen of it in recent years, and the fact that the film itself is quite a punching bag. It was the film that made Sean Connery decide to give up acting, and had he enjoyed this experience, maybe we would have had more Connery films to enjoy after this, so that alone is reason enough to despise the thing. And yet... I had a pretty good time with it. I'm certainly not going to go all hot takey with this, and don't get me wrong, it is a very flawed film, but when I compare it to other superhero movies, and particularly superhero movies that released around the same time as this, I'd say it easily sits in the top half of the ranking, but let's talk about some of the elements in more detail. Plot-wise, it's kind of a classic literary public domain Avengers. In 1899, a mysterious bad guy known as the Phantom, spelled with an F for some reason, is causing an awful lot of trouble in riling up tensions between the UK and Germany, breaking into the Bank of England and kidnapping German scientists. In response to this, the British Empire recruits a crack team of people, each with their own unique abilities, to head out on a mission to stop the Phantom and find out what's going on. This leads the group on a country-hopping trip, following clues and leads and twists and turns and internal tensions to try and bring down the bad guy. We, of course, have Sean Connery as Alan Quatermain, a skilled hunter and marksman. There's a nice running gag where he's occasionally having to pause to put on his glasses in order to make perfect shots, which I really like, and despite the film obviously being no fun for Connery to make, I actually think he's great to watch in this role. The guy was over 70 when filming this, and obviously there's a stunt double used for some shots, but on a whole, heck, I believe him in this action role a hell of a lot more than I believe Roger Moore in an action role in A View to a Kill, and for a 70-odd-year-old man, I think that's really impressive. And then forming the rest of the team around him, we have Nasiruddin Shah as Captain Nemo, who puts in a solid performance, and there's this big, cool submarine that slices through the sea to get everyone around, which is really cool. There's not Monica Bellucci, Peter Wilson as Mina Harker, who's a vampire from Bram Stoker's as Dracula and the only female of the group, so of course there's some attempt at some kind of love hexagon, heptagon, or something with her. Pretty much everyone gets horny for her at some point, except for Nemo and Quatermain. Then there's Stuart Townsend as Dorian Gray, a flamboyant immortal invulnerable to damage, Shane West as Tom Sawyer, Tony Curran as Rodney Skinner, the Invisible Man, and Jason Fleming as Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, who, in the latter's case, is presented as being the Hulk for some reason. Rounding out the main cast is Richard Roxburgh as M, the character who, very appropriately, gives Sean Connery his mission briefing. I can't begin to tell how cool I thought this was when I was a teenager seeing this film for the first time, and here we have Sean Connery being given orders by a guy named M. It just... It, well, there are a few other lines in here as well, actually, that might tickle the interest of the most ardent Bond fans. All the time in the world. He'll live to fight another day. And they even had the remarkable foresight to include a scene where Sean Connery reacts to the fact that Daniel Craig's last Bond film has been delayed again. Perhaps this was not his time to die after all. 
It's a cool idea to mash up all of these old literary characters, and obviously this film is based on the comic from Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill, and I understand that it's not a faithful adaptation, and Moore was certainly not happy with the finished film, but I should caveat this by saying that I've never read the work, so my opinions on this film are based purely on it, and not what it may or may not have done in relation to the source material. Anyway, for a bit of a geek like me, who kinda knew about all of these characters, even when I was 14 seeing this film, I kinda loved the team-up aspect, I was a big Universal Monsters fan, and those classics obviously include The Invisible Man and Dracula, and while those characters from those movies aren't literally presented here, I did have some familiarity with the concepts nonetheless. And I had knowledge of some of the others, from other aspects of media and older films that I'd seen, like Dorian Gray and Tom Sawyer. So yeah, honestly, even now I find the prospect of this group of people teaming up a hell of a lot more interesting than I'd do something like The Avengers, but maybe I'm just an easy lay when it comes to steampunk. The elevator pitch of the plot is quite simple, but when you get into some of the finer details of it, things can become a little murky in places, and ha! Huh? Like, there's pretty much a reason for everything, and I guess you just kind of roll with it when you're watching it, but some of the stuff is like... Okay, there's this whole chunk of the film that's set in Venice, and the villain has set off bombs that are having a chain reaction which are causing the city to collapse like dominoes. For some reason, the heroes deduce that they have to send a missile to a particular building and blow that up to stop this chain reaction of destruction from continuing, which is weird because the buildings are collapsing because of explosions, and the hero's solution to this problem is to collapse a building with an explosion. But whatever, this is a dumb fun film, and sometimes I'm having dumb fun, I'm fine. And the whole sequence in Venice is very entertaining. Nima has this really cool car that the heroes use to go out and save the day in, and I really do love the whole steampunk look of this whole film. There are features on the DVD talking about the costume and the design, and I just think it looks terrific. It has a really great aesthetic. There are a number of big action sequences throughout the film that are really well paced and choreographed. The music is bringing a lot of energy to it. <laughs> so on a purely sensory level, I'm actually having a really great time with this. Just so you're aware, the rest of this video is going to include some plot spoilers for the film, so if you haven't seen the film and you want to experience it in an unspoiled state, then please do stop this review now, go and watch the film, and then come back and finish this review, and be sure to let me know in that instance if I have indeed taken leave of my senses in giving this thing a relatively positive review. <laughs> so as much as I enjoy the action stuff, the design, and Sean Connery because, well, Sean Connery, there's not much interesting going on with the characters themselves. There's this whole sequence on the boat shortly after they've formed, where they're all trusting of each other, and it turns out that Dorian Gray is a mole secretly working for M, which stands for Moriarty, who is in fact the Phantom himself, and has been acquiring bits and pieces of the League in the hopes that he can create his own super army of hides and invisible men and Nemo's boats and stuff, and it's all handled quite economically, but so much time is spent on this deception and a kind of half assed love triangle involving Mina and, well, everyone under the age of 45, there's not that much room for an awful lot of other characters moments or drama, and the film is just over 100 minutes in length, so it doesn't muck about. The main plot for Connery's character is probably the most interesting in the entire film, and it's that him and Tom Sawyer have this whole surrogate father-son thing going on, and Connery teaches Sawyer how to shoot properly, which comes in handy during the climax, and while it's all very rote and predictable, I do like this little subplot. It gives the characters an arc, and it means that Connery's character has some emotional weight to bring to proceedings, even though I could have easily done without this Tom Sawyer character in the film at all. Spoiler alert again, Quatermain dies, and I guess that the thinking was that Sawyer would take up the leading role in future installments, because, uh, well, let me check my notes, um, because he's young, American, and attractive. Well, I, I guess that's reasoning enough. If they, by some minor miracle, had been able to make another one of these, I can't imagine how it'd have gone without Connery. I mean, he's the big draw for this film, and the cast would not have been the same without him. Obviously, they leave it open for him to come back in the next one, as they have this whole African and witch doctor everlasting life curse thing at the end of the movie, but given how grumpy Connery was at the film's European premiere and how he responds to this question about a sequel, I, I think it's clear we'd never see such a thing. Would you do a sequel to it? Would you like to do LXG2? Well, let's see how it goes. It's gone every well, very well, but um, until we... No. I've never been... No. Oh, no, it's madness, isn't it? <laughs> Would you do a sequel to it? Would you like to do LXG2? Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And now. 
The other main bright spots of the cast are Tony Curran's cheeky chappy Invisible Man and Jason Fleming's turn as Jekyll and Hyde, who somehow manages to make for the film's most engaging and appealing character drama in all the scenes that he has with himself. By the way, props to Tony Curran and Jason Fleming for being so much fun to listen to on the commentary track. They tell some really great, very self-aware stories, including this, which did make me chuckle. I mean, he is a... he's very down to earth chap, you know, I mean... The first time we had a read-through with him, you know, uh, there was one of his assistants and they said, um, we said, is, this, is there anything we should not do in front of Sean, <laughs> as it were? <laughs> Just anything. And they went, yeah, yeah, there's, there's two things you mustn't do in front of Sean. The first thing is, you must never do the voice, and the second thing is... You must never do the voice. So, what's the first thing? We've been thing doing the voice ever since. All the time! <laughs> 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 Which, uh, I, I guess, is more power to his elbow, because he never really... He, he let us get away he with it. He get away with it, yeah. Because we kept quoting lines from films that he did years ago, and he would be like, What the hell was that? I said, remember, carry a badge, carry a gun. Oh, Christ, yes. The, um, the, uh, the, the untouchable Sean. Yes! The, the one you won the Oscar for. Yes! The, yes, that one. And then we were yeah. doing, we were doing, <laughs> we put that in another time. We were then, having this meal, and uh, uh, Sean always <laughs> paid for dinner. And one night, me and Tony wanted to pay for dinner, and, yeah. and we ran up to the we, we ran up to the uh, to the till, and he was there already with his card. And Tony was going, "No, mate, no, 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 we're definitely getting this." And Big Sean goes, "Another time." <laughs> and Tony you know what? goes, "What? Another time, McLeod?" <laughs> <laughs> he, start, he started going, "Get out of here!" <laughs> oh God. Couldn't anyway, help it. you can't help it though, can you? I mean, you know. The special effects are a bit all over the place, and apparently because of the rush to get this film out for its summer release date, it was a bit of a scramble of multiple effects houses to get it done, and some of the stuff works really well. Explosions and miniatures are really cool, but some stuff looks so, so bad, even for 2003 standards. So, is The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen a great example of a superhero movie? No, and I'm certainly not going to die on a hill for the sake of defending this film's honour, but I think it has really achieved a bad reputation that is somewhat undeserved. There's an awful lot to enjoy in this, and I had a pretty good time I'm revisiting it. Its reputation would have you believe that it's in company with the likes of the 90s Avengers film, and it's nowhere near that. That film is a whole other level of bad. League, or LXG as it was nauseatingly referred to in some promo material, is a fun enough romp of silliness if you're willing to go with it and kind of just enjoy the ride. And as Hitchcock said, it's only a movie, but it's for your pleasure to enjoy. Enjoy. This film is much more up my alley than most superhero films, and a good deal of that is down to the design and setting. I love the whole visual style, the music, some fun characters, the plot is beyond daft, and there are some hokey effects, and I think they could have done with a bit more wit and knowing humour, but there's enough to enjoy in here, and hey, it's Sean Connery's final big screen performance. Nope, go away, you don't count. It also really puts into perspective how much Connery must have hated working on Your Own Live Twice. This film made him retire from acting, entirely, but he still manages to give a solid performance in it compared to the Bond film where he looks like he really just couldn't be bothered. So that brings us to our final point of order for this video, and that's for you to let me know if I have taken leave of my senses by being even remotely positive about this film. Genuinely, I had a much better time with it than I was anticipating coming back to it after all these years, and I swear to you I was not drunk when I was watching this film. This film's great. Where's Sibylle? So do let me know your honest thoughts on this one below. Also below you can find links to my social media pages. There's my Patreon page where you can go one extra step in supporting this channel and have the opportunity to vote in polls to decide what non-Bond movies I'm going to be covering on this channel like this one. There are also links below to my Twitter page and my Facebook page and also if you care to subscribe to this channel if you've enjoyed this video. That, that'd be really great. Thank you and um, drop a like and a comment as well if you feel inclined to do so. With all that being said and until next time Bond fans, so Long for now.